Welcome to the Brown Paint Podcast. My name is Adia and I will be your host. Brown paint is first and foremost a metaphor for repainting the narrative of what it means to be brown. It is a platform that hopes to inspire social change within the South Asian community through celebrating brown artists, entrepreneurs, innovators, renegades, the black sheep of this brown world. Together, we are breaking down the barriers and making our presence known. Um, Today, we have an anonymous speaker guest with us today. we're going to we're going to call him G today. So G is a 28 year old Indian man of South Indian Tamil origin, um, born and bred in Singapore. He had just quit the banking and finance industry, the conventional route which he had taken since university, um, which in his words became so suffocating and stifling that he needed to break out of it and pursue a career which is in line with his passion and happiness also a uh, avid enthusiast of South Asian cultural history, um, spirituality, Vedic astrology, and linguistics. He wishes to spread awareness on who brown folks are truly meant to be if we finally stripped off our adherence to colonial standards of beauty and sophistication. For example, What is regarded as cool or admirable by brown folks these days is wholly hinging on and incumbent on white commercial appeal, if that makes sense. (laughs) I believe this to be a very toxic collective mentality, he says. Welcome to the podcast, G. (laughs) Mystery man, G. (laughs) Um, Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yes. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah. Yes, yes. And, you know, the reason why I give this option of a non, uh, I'm so bad at saying this word. Anonymity. Anonymity, that's the one, um, (laughs) is because I want this platform to be um, a place where we can share super vulnerable and personal experiences. And um, I want people to go super deep and candid and like to the point where we don't even have a filter. We're not scared of offending anyone. We're not we're just being completely transparent and honest, um, whether anyone likes that or not. And for some people, anonymity is more comfortable. And if anonymity, oh my God, it's such a hard word to say. If, if that <laughs> make, if that inspires people um, and allows people to share their stories more vulnerably, then that is, I'm all down for that. So if you're listening here today and you have a personal story to share, um, and, you, you know, you are a bit maybe hesitant to share it because you don't want your parents to hear it or it's about your family or people that you know and you don't want them knowing. Um, but you feel like it's an important message that needs to be shared and other people would really um, heal and learn from your experience. Then please reach out to me um, to be on this podcast and to come on anonymously. Yeah, heck yes. And today I'm so excited because we are talking about a very um, interesting and also controversial topic, um, which is, which it shouldn't even be controversial. Both me and G are very passionate about this and it's beauty standards for men and um, the pressure to be a man nowadays. And like, yeah, and this is this is one thing that I don't. I we've talked about this before. That I mean, yeah, Dee and I, yeah, um, yeah. I, I don't identify as a feminist. Um, I'm not a third wave <laughs> feminist, and I find that there are you know very reasonable feminists nowadays and people that ask for reasonable things, but there are also extremists. But at the end of the day, it's all combined into the one movement. And if the movement refuses to call out the BS and the extremism that's in it, then this, they're, they're kind of accepting that that's a part of it. You know, the type of people that absolutely loathe men, that they think that men shouldn't even exist. And they are out there. And that, that's a big reason, one of 
it's not the only reason. There are a multitude of other reasons, but it's one of the biggest reasons I really disagree with the feminist movement and what it has become. Not what it was intended to be, because it was we all know that it was intended for greatness mm-hmm. and equality, but what is it, it has become, and I think it's become a bit of a monstrosity um, and slowly becoming more of one. Um, so welcome, G. <laughs> Um, Thank you. Yes. Um, but before we get into that juicy stuff, I want to mm-hmm. hear about this huge life transition you're going through right now, dropping out of okay. banking and pursuing your dreams. Tell me about that. How'd that come about? Okay. Well, um, I'm 28 years old, so I've had, you know, some time to discover myself. And I have always taught myself to be somewhat of a creative mind or at least a child who had very keen interest in creative expression and artistic pursuits like throughout my childhood um i especially enjoyed aspects of certain aspects of the performing arts um and um specifically uh, specifically drama and also music in a sense i have not harnessed any skill in playing musical instruments but i've always been very interested in using my voice to express emotions feelings and ideas whether it's speech or song because i i'm wow. i wouldn't say that um i'm a great singer but it's just been an interest of mine i've just always wanted to sing so i've always had these um i don't know these innate interests in in my head and in my heart growing up but my life started changing after a levels um i haven't been performing well in school mainly because of um, criticism that I faced for being so different from other brown people and brown men. So um, after A levels, I didn't do well, and I started observing as I grew older. I started seeing what um, brown culture really champions, what modern day brown culture really, um, you know, puts up on a pedestal. And I really wanted that because I felt so rejected by my own culture and community for the longest time. And I wanted to feel the love and appreciation and acceptance from them. So what I ended up doing was taking the, un, you know, the conventional route of taking a business administration, administration degree, and then somehow ending up working in the finance industry. But um, after some time, I have to say that um, I, somehow realized that this this just isn't me because I wasn't getting the acceptance I craved for. I wasn't being um, loved and appreciated for who I am, no matter how hard I tried, because I guess I still was different from the rest. Although I was in banking, I was in a corporate career, but people still didn't treat me um, as nicely as I wanted them to. So that was a huge part of why I dropped out because it wasn't... Um, getting me what I wanted. And at the same time, I was going mad. I was going crazy by the day because I just couldn't be happy. And people don't understand that. I don't know, like five days in a week, you're at work. It's a huge part of who you are. How can you survive? How could you even be remotely happy by doing what that isn't you, that doesn't represent you at all? It's something, I mean, it's crazy that people, a lot of our parents, this is what they did for their entire lives and that is why they end up with a lot of I believe that's why they end up with a lot of medical conditions because of tragedy face and because they're just not happy and I do not wish to be like that and that is why I made the conscious decision to just exit the industry once and for all and just be happy because I feel that that's a lot lacking in our culture people just don't know how to be happy and it's, it's something that I wanted to discuss today as well I, I feel that brown people um our DNA is very much entrenched in the arts. South Asian culture, like our foundation and basis is very much the arts, but we are denying ourselves our true gifts and our strengths. And that is why I was like, I'm not being stupid by quitting. I know I'm doing the right thing, so I'm done. So that's what propelled me to make this decision. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. Um, I think you are so correct and so right I I agree with you like wholeheartedly on everything you said especially the part about how um brown culture you know we deny our right to be ourselves in our culture it's 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 not possible like whether that's you know 
like whether that's being coming out as gay or being an artist or just being outspoken or yeah you know saying just deviating from opinion. this template yeah yeah just yeah. yeah exactly it's just it's not yeah. um accepted when when yeah. <laughs> yeah and and then if you don't accept who you are how how do you expect to be happy so it, it's yeah. it's just this huge cycle isn't it um yeah and can i just say there it breaks my heart because I see a lot of brown kids, especially like in this kind of period of time, we're in at our twenties, that just are just not living their best lives. And I mean, oh, that's yes. a judgment, right? It's a judgment. I don't know yeah. for a fact, of of course, but they just look to be miserable. They look to be in that mode of needing to impress, <laughs> are needing to You're right. their yeah. worth. There's the huge yeah. thing about brown culture, which I think that comes yeah. from the po post-colonial caste system, that needing yeah. to promote, like needing to prove your worth to your parents, yes. to your community, to yeah. your tribe, your culture, and it's yeah. just horrible. So can I just say, the fact that most brown kids, the the, the truth is, they'll probably never break out of it oh. their entire oh, life. Yes, the fact that we, we see it everywhere. Them, exactly, yeah. we've seen it, and yeah. it's probably a lot of our parents. Yeah they have mm -hmm. they're stuck with that for life now but the fact yeah. that you've like you and i have defeated mm -hmm. all odds and you know <laughs> come to that realization no matter mm -hmm. how early or late i think that's yeah. incredible props to you seriously because thank you it's so such much a huge yeah. thing to do yeah mm -hmm. thank you i mean i really like it, it's really nice to hear this from another brown person because yeah. i know that most brown kids wouldn't be supportive of my decision. They would think it's yeah. stupid. They would think that um, something is wrong with me or why am I being such a disappointment to my family and culture? But it's good to know that there are people like you out there who did the same thing and know what exactly that, know what exactly what I went through and really want me to do what, you know, I love instead of doing what I hate because I've always hated numbers and mathematics and it's just so unlike me. So it's so stupid to actually do that. You know, yes. why would I want to do that? That is what it's stupid. Like dropping out of the industry, that's not stupid. And I feel that brown people need to realize that. That's very important so that they can be successful and be happy at the same time. 100%. Yeah. 100%. Um, and what, uh, I know you sort of briefly touched onto this, but I'd like to dive deeper into what got you into banking out of all things. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a scary story. I mean, <laughs> I mean, not 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 a scary story. It's just that it's got to do with brown pressure, um, especially like um, these days, um, especially in conversations amongst young brown folks as well. It has become um, common knowledge and very regularly pointed out that our culture has zero tolerance for artistic endeavors and aspirations like they just wouldn't think that it's something their kid should pursue at all so um but what we aren't really discussing is is the fact that um we're doing it to please everybody else and everybody else meaning people that might not even have our best interests at heart like you know the aunties that gossip or our dad's friends who are always like looking at us to um evaluate our achievements and see where we are going in life like i don't know it's just what we're doing is so silly and um what we're allowing to continue to happen is so silly and um so what happened was i bought into it and when i started observing around me what brown people really appreciate and respect and because i've been i felt rejected my whole life because i've always been into um not even alternative areas of interest. It's just that um, I didn't prescribe to the conventional brown ideals. Like, um, like for example, I'm not the I, I'm not someone who thinks that um, I don't know. Like, a man needs to always display aggression. I think that's very toxic. In fact, I mean, we can get into that later when we're discussing yes. about brown men. So, I've always been I've always felt rejected. So when I got older, it started to fester the feeling of the feelings of pain and rejection. It really started to hamper my progress as well. Like I just felt so I felt as in it was very difficult for me to relate to the people around me, to my own community. And because I felt so displaced within my own community, I felt that it's time I tried to reconnect back 
with my culture. And I thought I was mistaken that the only way to do it was to have a corporate career. So an opportunity came my way to work in a multinational company. I shall not name which company, but um, I was asked to join the finance department. And I was like, uh, I'm not really sure, but when I um, told this information to my parents and my extended family, they were all so happy. They were so proud of me. And that sort of um, ful fulfilled me temporarily. And that was exactly what I wanted my whole life to have them love me and be happy for me and be proud of me. So I was like, you know what, since I'm getting what I want, which is to make my people happy, I'll just get on board with this job and see how it goes. But little did I know that I would end up being so miserable. And um, so that's what how it happened. It was mainly to please my family and my culture. Wow. Yeah. And, and what an incredible thing like to admit to because I think that there is such strength in admitting that you you screwed up or did a disservice to yourself. Um, you know, nothing's ever really a screw up. I think that everything's a learning lesson in life and an opportunity to grow. But I think there's such power in like um, admitting that because I don't know about you. <laughs> And again, I have to be very careful with my wording because there are very sensitive people out there these days. But um, <laughs> there, I find Agreed. that there are a lot of people that, especially brown young people, that find it really difficult to accept that about themselves, that perhaps they did something for the wrong reasons or they're not even opening to yeah. questioning their actions um, well, perhaps I meant into, I, I don't mean to always be picking on med, but it just so happens that it's the, it's the epitome of brand success, but there, I mean, it's your own personal experience. So of course it's the yes. first thing that comes to your mind. Yeah. yeah the first so. thing that comes to my mind is like the, yeah. the people that do med for like all the superficial reasons. And I think, gosh, I would not <laughs> want you to be my doctor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. So do you think that there are a lot of people that have a hard time. Um, I suppose also you are a deep thinker. I find that you have an ability oh, to kind okay. of really go deeper and oh, wow, self-reflect in a way that most people don't. Yeah, so maybe it's that. More reflective but, than most. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it's yeah. that. But do you find that most people have a hard time admitting that maybe they went into something for cultural reasons, for because of their parents, and they? They, when someone asks them, oh, you sure you didn't do that for your, their parents? Yeah. Like, no. Do you think that that happens yeah. quite a bit? I think that I think that happens a lot. I mean, around me at least. Because yeah. um, in Singapore, um, it's a bit different. Because, um, I mean, although we face the same challenges as other South Asian communities in the diaspora, people mm -hmm. forget that um, Singapore is very much an Asian country. Yes. So um, the dominant race in Singapore, for example, is an East Asian race. It's yes. yeah. So the majority race, you know, they kind of impose their own ideals and priorities onto minorities as well. So I think in my country, it's a bit different because um, people sort of like tend to buy into what they say is best instead of really. Um, trusting like like their own instincts like even like if they feel that um this type of food choice um, might not be something their friends and family might enjoy but because the majority race has deemed it to be the best selling food item in the country they would be like oh you know no no it's, it's great it's perfect it's, it's exactly what we need you know for the festive occasion we have to buy that i think everyone would enjoy it so um, there's that added pressure as well in Singapore, but when it comes to brown culture, I do believe what you're saying is absolutely right, is 100% true. Um, they are afraid to admit it to themselves because I think they're afraid to, to face the fact that they might not be as good as they think they are in like a particular field like medicine or law or finance. Like they might I don't, I don't they just want to upkeep this image that oh yes i'm one of the best performing employees of my company like because of brown culture brown pressure like what you i think you have mentioned brown pressure as i mean you mm -hmm. kind of coined this term i think brown pressure um, <laughs> so i think because of that um a lot of people they feel this pressure to always upkeep this image of being this um 
pragmatic and tough individual within brown culture like it's something that is very predominant and prevalent like having this image of like yes i can accomplish whatever i want in a corporate career like i am going to be as successful as my parents want them to be it's it became part of their self esteem like it yes. sorry i mean it kind of makes what uh, it kind of makes them feel good about themselves like it became so inherent and engraved you know and Oh. That's very dangerous, like and I think that identity. is why you're right. Yeah, like it's become a part of their identity so much so that they can't. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Sorry, could oh, you sorry. That um, I second? said, do you mean that it's become like the fact that, oh, like I'm Adia and I'm a doctor, like that's <laughs> yeah. become so yeah. much a part of their identity. It's like they take identity, so much pride yes. in it yeah. that the minute they um question their motives behind what they chose to do it puts them into an identity crisis and yes. they can't handle yes. it because it's the so crisis yeah interwoven with who they their perception of they who think they, they are, are. yeah yeah exactly yes actually that's true i mean identity is the key word here i think they have yeah. they are not realizing that they have a distorted perception of their own identity mm-hmm. they have sort of created a false image of who they are like like what i mentioned at the beginning like they're denying they might be denying they might be denying their own strengths and 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 gifts mm-hmm. like for example um someone that i know who um is working in pr and marketing her strengths actually lie in like video editing and photography and like maybe promoting certain type of uh, lifestyles like healthy life choices and like this person is really talented at um i would say content creation mm. but instead this person is actually working in a pr firm mm. in an events firm so this person isn't really doing what they want to do that would make them happy and you know be successful at the same time so so they have formed this identity of themselves that oh yes i'm a corporate bitch who you know could excel at at what i'm doing and and outdo my colleagues you know like this is what's expected of me in my culture so i'm just going to do it it's who i am but i'm like no but that's not who you are you love creating your own original content and spreading awareness yeah. about your own findings and discoveries but instead no you're just i don't know doing things by the book and yeah I find that actually that that's such a reoccurring theme in brown culture. I I call them compromises. Big life yeah. compromises yeah. for brown culture yeah. because it's like it's like it's like a painter or someone that was just passionate about being an an artist and a painter and um I don't know. They they were very like into the visual arts. Their compromise, you see a lot of those people go into architecture or interior design because yeah. it's, it's yes. still it's 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 like oh i'm still doing art but in uh, a more yeah. professional way where i can be respected yeah. and i can and have security more and money, money. Yeah, yeah yeah and yeah. and yeah. like look there's nothing wrong with that <laughs> but mm-hmm. if it's going to make you unhappy and if it's going to make you stray so far away from yourself that you don't even recognize you anymore then that's not a good thing yeah. right and like you said exactly. it sounds like your friends like tried to make that compromise like compromise, like you said yeah. she wants to be known as a corporate person rather than a creative person yeah. she's gone and found, yeah. found yeah. the most creative job that she can find in a corporate setting in order to still yeah. have that creativity and she probably still does yeah. photography on the side as a side hustle but yeah yeah, yeah. like it's just it, it's like that half in half it's out it's really situation. sad Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I I personally like, hate that. I, no, yeah, it's yeah. not fair. It's not fair because yeah. why can't you have it all? Why can't you have mm-hmm. it all? Yeah. You know, it's that Exactly. Um, it's such a limited way of thinking. It's like oh, like life's hard and, you know, I need job security because I need to pay the bills and society tells me that I have to have a house and a kid and kids by a certain age. So I I'm just going to be half in half outside hustle my dreams and hope it works out. but it never works out that way you can't be half in half out you got to commit yeah. and i mean i think that's the laws of the universe the law of attra- attraction yeah, and things exactly. like that i i don't yeah. think you're going to attract your dreams by side hustling them after your 9 to 5 mm-hmm. i don't mm-hmm. think it's going to work yeah exactly i mean it could never work because end of the day i think every human we have an emotional threshold of sort like mm. we can only 
like withstand stress and pressure for a limited number of time like I think my tolerance level was so low like after four years I just quit yeah. the industry but wow. some people have a higher level of tolerance so they might last yes. for a decade or two decades but I think after some time they might start I don't know burning out like at the age of 45 and then that's when they really face like their midlife crisis right like you know yes. like in their 50s and so it's yeah. it's really dangerous to continue deluding yourself like oh you know I, I'm still doing art but I'm doing it professionally because I can make more money this whole distorted perception of who they are and what makes them it's very detrimental to their mental health and that's what happened to me mm-hmm. like over the past four years and that's why I quit but I feel really sorry for people like my friend for example who probably might do it longer than I had but um, I think that because they had lasted for so long in the industry they might actually you know be afraid to leave it because that becomes their livelihood and it's more unlikely you know that they would want to quit it to quit the industry because how else are they going to make money at the age of 55 or 45 because you know, like it's very dangerous for them to quit at that point of time as well. So I would encourage people to just leave what they're doing if they're not happy with it and do something that they enjoy, like early on at an early age, instead of waiting at a, you know, waiting for so long and then you're lost and you're almost like stuck in this unfortunate situation that you can't get out of because, yeah. And now you're stuck with like a family and bills, not stuck, like blessed with a family, but um, mm-hmm. you have the additional pressure and then then at that point you almost can't quit like it would be selfish yeah you can't quit yeah because it's like well okay you have a family to take care of and that's where yeah. your priorities are so yeah. like I just wish I think the 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 cure to this problem would be if our culture just um, if our culture uh, was okay with I'm not going to say encouraged because I think that's too aspirational at this point but was just okay with the idea of young people exploring who they are and what they want to do and like what their life purpose is at a young age because I think the exploration is great because in especially when you graduate from like 18 to 30 I think this age gap is so important even biologically speaking it's that it's a time you're supposed to explore it's a time yeah. you leave the herd and you explore the your yeah. surroundings and you figure out the yeah. person that you want to be, what kind of yes. life you want to live. And unfortunately, our culture, coupled with society's expectations to just hurry up, get into uni and figure it out, I think it's super detrimental and almost stunts a human's growth. Because oh, yes. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a massive part of our growth. And I, I think, yeah. We, yeah, I think we need to encourage exploration more so that um yeah that that yes. doesn't happen so that you don't get to 50 and you're like yeah oh crap I've been yeah. doing it all wrong my entire life and yeah. I've wasted my life now it's yeah it's such a waste it really is a waste. yeah it's horrible to see it exactly I mean it, it's so sad because I have seen people in their 50s like um not in my family but I've you know like like my friends or extended family or family friends I've seen people in their 50s and they're just so sad like they're just so unhappy and they have no outlet to you know to use to actually I don't know be happy again yeah. like they're just so stuck man like it's almost as though they don't know what to do they, they feel so helpless and when I look at that I'm like oh my god if I had continued you know working in finance I think that would have been me and th- which is why I'm happy that I didn't see it as a loss, like how most brown people would have, that I quit mm-hmm. the industry. But I see it as a gain because I wouldn't end up miserable when I'm 50. Because when I'm 50, I want to look back at my life and be proud of myself and be happy that, I don't know, I I came to this place um, by doing what I love. And I mean, more importantly, you know, in my 50s, I want to be happy. Yes. I think that's the most important thing. Yeah. I don't want to be miserable in my 50s. I mean, that's the worst thing that could happen to anyone. But it happens a lot in brown culture, which is it does. pretty unfair. Yeah. It does. It does. A hundred percent. And what, so now, like, now that you've, you know, you've, you've jumped that hurdle, you know, we're here now, you've overcome the transition and now you're in this beautiful spot 
And I know that some people can find this overwhelming, but I personally love to see people in this space because I feel that Mm -hmm. it is the one time in life where you have ultimate choice, ultimate autonomy to just think freely and choose freely. And I always just look at people and think, oh gosh, what are they going to choose? It's like, you could be (laughs) anything. You could be an astronaut. Um, What do you choose to do? What, What are your dreams? Okay, well, um, aside from hobbies and and interests, I mean, I I can talk about that later, but when it comes to profession, um, I've always been very passionate about um, public speaking, about delivering messages across the board, like helping the masses sort of understand and and process information and different perspectives. So um, when I was very young, about 10 years ago, when I was still in junior college, when I was doing my A-levels, I've always wanted to get into journalism because I've always wanted to spread awareness um, about certain issues that uh, are not really being talked about. But I realized that that industry in itself, it's also very, it, it has a very corporate structure as well. And so I probably wouldn't be pursuing that. But instead, I've realized that I wanted that something that would make me happy, that would, that would um that would be a meaningful sort of career choice for me would be something to do with public speaking as well, but possibly training people on that, like training people how to carry themselves well and, and um, sort of not, not just, you know, training people for interviews, but maybe training people to uh, give public speeches, like at certain events, like maybe charity organizations that are trying to spread awareness about um, certain diseases like Ebola, and and also like the norma disease i don't know if you've heard of it it's yeah sure. like it's it's quite a debilitating disease as well and yeah. so there's a lot of things going on in the world and a lot of people are not really um able to get much information about it because social media is very saturated there's so much of information everywhere so yes. people are getting lazy to look up information online so that and I also wanted, it's, it's yeah. the information that they want you to see Yes, exactly. It's not, yeah, it's, it, you know, yeah. it's, it's heavily it's like biased. bias and everything. Yeah. 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 So I want to get into a career, a profession that would train people on how to be authentic speakers. I think that would be, wow. yeah, that would, that would be the best choice for me, I think. Or maybe even something like um, a narrator or like a voice narrator, for example. Like I've always wanted to do that, like a voice over profession like that's something that wow. I've always wanted to do in my life yeah so I'm currently I looking yeah oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. I was just go ahead say the voice narrator thing um I guess that's where your performative side would really come out to play yeah huh? yeah 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 because yeah. um over the years um I've sort of lost my interest in acting like so maybe if I pick it up again because now I'm free maybe I could I don't know like <laughs> go yes. for classes then maybe we'll see because it's been so long it's been 10 years since I've even yeah. thought about it as a possibility because of brown pressure I just came out of that mental space of wanting to become a performer becoming an actor because throughout my childhood I was in drama club like since I was like 10 I was like on stage performing and acting wow. like yeah in like when I was 16 when I was a teenager as well I, I I've always been um recognized for my acting ability in school and outside of school as well when I've done um, voluntary performances if that like community service for the masses so like organizations um, would sort of um, try to get teenagers to put up plays for the public to raise awareness about certain topics and I was part of those performances as well so I've always been very keen in acting and performing but for the past 10 years, I've not had the opportunity to explore that. So maybe this might be the chance to slowly get into it again. I don't know. It's quite scary to think about it, but I hope that I could do it one day. Like, yeah, maybe the voice narrator job could sort of give me more avenues for that as well. You know, I, I love I love people discovering their dreams and watching that that <laughs> process happen, seriously, because I get goosebumps when something like I, it just feels so right. And when you said voice narrator and also a public speaking coach, I was like, 
Yeah. That would suit you so much. Oh, you're thank you're you. very thank put you together. So I've said this to you so many <laughs> times now. Um, I, I just think he's the most eloquent, most put together what? Oh my professional God. lad. Oh. Yes. And I think you'd be such a great really? coach too. Because oh. you're very neat in thank your you. thinking. You're very organized and uh, clean and clear. OCD, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a that. Bit, I don't know yeah. what goes on in your head. Yeah, but, a bit. No, it's great. I've been called that before, so. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> but I've I don't think OCD that's a bad thing. I think it's great yeah. because I think that especially for a coach, you need to be able to, like, communicate information to your client in a bite sizable way. Yeah, um, the nitty gritties and, like, yeah. the tiniest details need to be paid attention to. Yeah, you're right. Yes, that's true. Communicating how to communicate. I reckon that's yeah. one of the hardest things to do. Oh, uh, yeah. It might be. Type of person to do that. So that good on you. That'd be really exciting. Oh, wow. I can't wait to see what happens. <laughs> so this well, is so you. exciting. And I just, you know, I'm going to follow on with your life and, you know, obviously oh, continue thank our you. friendship and I'm excited to see yeah. where you go. Um, thank you so much. Well, I mean, yeah. because of the pandemic, maybe the opportunities are quite limited right now, mm. but I'm willing to be patient because I think that it's worth it. It's, you know, it, it's not something that I would regret. Like going yes. after this, it wouldn't be something I would regret. So I hope your words come true. You know, so I hope, I hope so you're a good too. luck charm. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Thank you. And you know what? I'm praying for you. I hope whoever's listening to this and is feeling this <laughs> conversation and resonating with his story, pray for him too. Yeah, you know, we'll put it yeah. out there. It's Please do. Thank you. Seriously. Um, <laughs> let's talk about um, the pressure for men specifically in oh and, oh no um yeah this is a can of worms so i want to just disclaimer yes. by saying i'm so happy that we're talking about this because i think that mm-hmm. in a day in a time and age like today men poor men they just get put on the black banner no one talks oh about my god issues. Yeah. No, men, everyone talks about women being insecure men are insecure too they just don't know how to oh. talk about it and yeah. i love men i think men are the <laughs> coolest as Cher would say. and i think that they deserve a little bit more attention and men's issues mm-hmm. need to be put to the forefront more often so let's mm-hmm. let's get into that topic what are what's your opinion the pressure for men specifically <laughs> in brown culture okay I'm scared to get into it, but let's just do <laughs> it. Right, because you're I anonymous. Think... <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> I'm not, so okay. I'm the one that needs to be scared. Oh, yeah. The yeah. feminist coming after me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, maybe we could start off with um, an observation that I've made, like, over the years. Like, it's been the same thing happening in front of my eyes. Ever since I was, like, in primary school, since I was, like, seven or eight years old, I've seen this happening. Typically, in brown culture, especially... Um, for men to be an aggressive person has been very confused and mistaken for a very long time for being an an assertive person. Mm. So I'm like, but it's so funny because this is an instant indicator for manliness and power for men. So no one has really opposed it and it has almost become a mistake. It has almost become a mistaken fact in brown culture like people think that yeah it's true if you're not aggressive you're weak you need to be aggressive to be tough you need to always be tough like brown men are always expected to be the toughest man in the room and i'm just like um that's so unlike me because i value courtesy and good manners and compassion this is how i operate in general so um I cannot stand people who communicate brashly and impatiently, but for some reason, that's how men are expected to behave in brown culture. And this comes from the false identity for men that is that has been created in brown culture. Like men are expected to be um, the breadwinners, um, to always fight for their family. For example, um, if someone snatches like your girlfriend's purse, the man is expected to go after the thief but in fact both you know the victim and the victim's boyfriend should be going after the 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 thief right but in bound culture oh no the woman is expected to cry and be a damsel and the man needs to be this superhero but i'm like what are you even talking about that is so stupid like it's her bag she's entitled to be angry too if she wants to (laughs) to go and run after her purse you know that's fine and if he chooses not to because maybe he's not as fast a runner as her you know, maybe he, 
I don't know, is having a bad day and and um, a bad back day, and you know he's not able to physically, uh, I don't know, perform. So you know, like maybe he wants to stay behind while his girlfriend runs after the purse. That, that should be completely acceptable. But oh no, that's such a taboo in bound culture. So there's just, there's a lot of pressure on men, like to start off like with, with the discussions. The, the main thing that I think the pressure surrounds is this image of toughness. Like they need to upkeep like this aggressive sort of persona and. People don't realize that this adds a lot of pressure on men because they're expected to behave like an aggressive person at every time of the day. And if they become vulnerable for even one second, they're sort of picked on for that, which is not mm. fair at all. So I think the main problem stems from that. I don't know whether you agree, but I feel that this is the main problem from brown men is this persona they need to upkeep all the time. Like, why do men need to be tough all the time? They want to chill and relax too. They want to listen to some music and, I don't know, have like a couple of beers with their guy friends talking about, I don't know, art. Maybe not about fighting with with someone when they come to attack them like because i feel that that's what men are supposed to discuss like oh you know if, if there's any problems that are coming up their way this is how we should approach it this is how we should tackle it like but no brown men don't want to talk about that all the time they want to talk about their own hobbies and interests as, as well but mm -hmm. if they do that they are viewed as a weakling or lame or someone that isn't really living up to um the appropriate standards for what a man should be in brown culture mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. yeah. So firstly, I'm not a man. So I, I don't, <laughs> I haven't had that experience that you have. And I haven't really okay. sit, had like, I haven't off, like I probably have, but I can't really remember me sitting in a circle of men and listening to their conversation being like a dominant memory or something that happened in my life. So I'm not sure what men talk about, but I'm like, I'm totally going to take your word for it. And I can see glimpses <laughs> from like what my experience is. I can definitely see glimpses of how that is such a true thing. And I like yeah. what you said about um, assertiveness being confused mm -hmm. for, I mean, aggressiveness being confused yeah. for assertiveness. And yes. I think that, yeah, assertiveness is naturally more of a masculine trait um and that doesn't yeah. mean that women can't have it it just means that yeah. um it it's like i don't know if we think of divine masculinity and oh um, yes yes divine femininity, divine femininity or like the yeah. fibonacci spiral and right. squares yeah. like you know the yes, actual yes. energy of masculine energy versus feminine energy and how it mm -hmm. flows how masculine energy is more linear and feminine energy is more curvy and um yeah. like assertiveness yeah. is a masculine trait um mm -hmm. but then you're right like it's like assertiveness is a good thing but then like on its polar end it's aggressive and it's 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 not good um yeah yes it's not good at all yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then that's where we get toxic masculinity and yeah <laughs> exactly yeah yeah i definitely do see that aggressive behavior in brown and actually come to think of it I'm like now that i'm thinking about it more and more you really got me to think this and I yeah it's, see it's it. predominantly the attitude that they carry with themselves wherever yes. they go like yeah and do you think i just came with another i came up with another thought just then that okay. do you think that the aggressiveness comes with this it comes because of the pressure that is put upon them by society like to perform, to be like the most manliness, uh, to be the most well, manly and everyone's yeah. trying to outman each other and it's this huge competition. And in order to do that, they have to mm -hmm. be a certain level of assertive, but then it becomes too much and it becomes aggressive. Yes. Yeah, I, I actually agree with you. I think that it's something that has been seen by older generations like because mm. they have always been this way because like our fathers fathers and their fathers and their fathers they've always had this image like when we read about it in mm. south asian history or when we talk about our grandfathers from you know with our parents and uncles they would say mm. that oh uh, my father was a very tough man you know he was mm. a very brave man that is always the image that they attach to mm. their forefathers like they take so much pride in being a tough person but um i feel that this this behave such behavior, this aggressive behavior, it mm. may have been necessary when brown people were violently oppressed in the past yeah. by colonialists and they were mistreated on a daily basis during colonial times, or maybe even in pre-colonial times when 
there was a certain system, a certain hierarchy, and people had to fight for their living, for their survival. So I think this approach to life may have given them good results in the past. But right now, things are different. It's not really compatible with current times. So mm-hmm. that's why I think it it started breeding toxic masculinity because it's so incompatible with what happens today. Because in the past, I think people had to fight for themselves every day. Yeah. So yeah. you had to be a brave man to survive. But right now, you can be a, a sensitive gentleman and still do well in life. We have been given yes. the opportunities to, to be that. And if a brown man identifies with being a sensitive gentleman, he should be allowed to be that. Why does he need to put up this false image of like this tough, brave, warrior-like person. I mean, like what I said, it was necessary in the past. Everyone had to be that way probably, but right now we don't have to. And I think brown culture is not understanding that. Like they're still behind in that thought process. Yeah, Yeah. that's 100% true, I think. Like, I think that especially in this, like this time that we're in this generation, um, we're probably- The The feminist world. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we're probably the most um privileged generation to walk oh. this planet in terms of yeah. humans i think so because our parents and their parents and their parents they've all had to like live through some sort of war or some sort of situation yeah. and of course yeah. now we're going through the pandemic but we're not having to like serve our country or like like yeah. find food or you know that kind of thing yeah. of course there are countries like that but um in the western world i'm talking about this millennial generation is the luckiest to have you know mm-hmm. been born on yeah. this earth and yes. i think that yeah. um so you were saying sorry i've, I've forgotten what you were saying um, <laughs> um no, no, i was talking about how um this image of a tough brave warrior like oh persona, that's right i got it stuck in our culture for centuries now yes. like it's because it's so championed and promoted within brown yeah. culture, it's still sticking to brown culture, you know, like and a now leech. It's not, so. rest, it's not necessar- necessary in this modern context. Yeah. That's what I was saying. Yes. Um, yeah. So like... It becomes toxic masculinity in today's context because yeah. it's so unnecessary. It becomes something that yeah. is very toxic. Yeah. I think that given the fact that we are in the most blessed generation to ever walk the planet, I think that this is the opportunity to re reconfigure our inner workings inner biological workings um Mm -hmm. because even just if you take um like stress some sort of stress to the body so you might have an interaction where someone offends you or you just don't like someone and your heart starts racing and your body doesn't know the difference between you're just talking to someone they verbally offended you versus you running away from a lion and that's what the primitive body oh, right, right. and it's sort of yeah. the same thing you need like same thing you were talking about we need like this is a time in history that we are learning to differentiate with from what is um from what our body thinks is true versus what's actually happening mm. and to yeah. put our biological triggers on the back burner and say well it's not applicable now to this modern day context so for example the masculinity thing maybe mm. aggr- aggressiveness was a totally valid and worthy and like necessary thing for survival yes. back in nowadays but yeah, i mean back in the old now. days but nowadays yeah. It's yeah. not applicable to the modern context. And yes, so about not at all. Training ourselves to be like, okay, well, that trait of mine can take a back seat. Like, you know, it might it might be necessary in certain contexts. Like if someone mm. comes at me oh, with yes, a gun, yeah. I might of course, need to like definitely. get the fists out. But yes, yes. it can take a back seat for now. And I think that that's like for the most the, part, it, yeah. Yeah, the psychological yeah. rewiring that we're kind of collectively going through as a human collective yes. generation um exactly a- i mean it's I mean, exactly like what you just said i mean it, it really sheds a lot of light on on the fact that we need different approaches to succeed today like we should be promoting and adhering to different values and value systems that are more relevant to the condition of today's world like we shouldn't be sticking to what worked for brown people in the past it's yeah. just it's very unastute like it's so stupid but then it's thought of as something that, you know, it should be, you know, how it is. Like, does that yeah. make sense? Like, like a hard um, and fast rule. It, it worked yeah, for us, like, 
for ages. So <laughs> yes. it's, it's, yeah, it's just solid truth that we need to live yeah. by. Exactly. And that needs to be dissolved. Valuable. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it, it's just so unfair for brown men to live in this world, to have like their one foot in this, in today's world and the other foot, you know, stuck in <clears throat> past values and, and value systems. Like, I feel that they're treading on two worlds, like the past and the present. And I think that wow. is why, yeah, I really do believe that is why toxic masculinity is so prevalent today because brown men cannot sort of escape from the past because all these archaic values are still being imposed and pushed onto them. So they always feel that, yes, I need to be tough. I need to be aggressive. I need to be a man. But they don't realize that there's so many different ways to be a man. Mm. And there's just, they're still sticking to this one particular way. Yeah. And you know what? I, I just, because I've been listening to some, oh God, here it comes out, my political views, <laughs> some more conservative <laughs> political content, commentators. Um, for example, Yogi Oabs. I don't agree with everything he says. By the way, he's an amazing brown man on YouTube. Yes, yes, yeah. But there's course, one thing definitely. that he said that just blew my mind. And mm -hmm. I don't know why I hadn't ever thought of this before, but he said that okay. men and women are different, but they're mm -hmm. also the same. But the thing about it is that there are masculine qualities and there are feminine qualities and they can be interwoven between yes, the yes, sexes. Yes, yeah. But when yeah. they are interwoven, for example, when a female is assertive or when a man mm. is sensitive, which is typically more a female trait, it's going mm. to show up differently in terms of quality. And that's, that's the difference. Right, right. So it's not that a yes. woman might be assertive. It's just that when she, when a woman is assertive, it's she's still assertive, but just it'll yeah. show up in it's a expressed way. differently. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the actual quality yeah. of the um the action or the feeling or behavior is mm -hmm. that's what's it's the different. same. It's, so yeah. like I think that this this is a powerful thing for men if if like toxic males could understand this because I think there's a huge fear around being a sensitive man because it makes them feel weak. Weak, but yeah. I don't think I think that if if a man embraced their emotional sensitive side, it wouldn't look like how a how it would on a woman. And yes, that yes, would be yeah. really empowering for men to understand because they'd realize actually it doesn't look in their eyes womanly or weak because at the yeah. end of the day, you don't want to be something you're not either you can't we can't force men to become females or females to become men yeah. but it's yeah. just yeah. be sensitive in your own way and yeah in your own way yes yeah, yeah. like yeah. it might be talking about you know it, talking about your feelings with your guy friends it might not be like you sitting there oh, crying yeah. <laughs> Because that's what yeah. us girls do. We'll get together and we'll like cry about our feelings. You don't have to cry, but yeah, it might can just, just be a yeah. simple conversation. Conversation, so just, like a very different. harmless discussion. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, exactly. Like, I'm so glad you pointed that out because I, I've actually, I, I wanted to speak to you about this today. Like, I don't know if you have observed this or noticed this, like with mm -hmm. brown men around you. Have you seen the uneasy, uncomfortable love between? them like their fathers and sons or yes. um their brothers it's so like yes. uncomfortable like they, they find it so difficult for them to express their love for one another mm. and like with their moms and their sisters and cousins like you know they're so comfortable with with um being vulnerable but with mm. each other they are so afraid to be vulnerable and that's mm. what i've noticed like since a very young age because this is how brown men are sort of groomed to be mm. to not be vulnerable with one another to always to each other and encourage each other to be tough all the time mm. so they find it so difficult to discuss their feelings like what you mentioned like that's what they should be doing like there's nothing wrong with that but they perceive it as a sign of weakness to want to discuss their feelings like they've been taught to never discuss their feelings and always shut their feelings down and be tough all the time so i'm glad that you brought this up because i feel that I don't know, it's not being done at all because, for example, like my my brown guy friends, my brown brothers or whatever, like when I, because because I'm aware of this problem and I approach them with kindness and sensitivity and understanding, they are so shocked and they're so appreciative of it because they're like, oh my God, no other guy has ever done this for me. But then I'm like, 
oh yeah, because all of you, y'all are afraid to do it because they are more comfortable doing it with women. Like for example, with a girl that whom they have only known for two weeks, they're dating for two weeks, they'll be more comfortable with being vulnerable and sensitive towards that girl instead of their guy friends whom they've known for their entire lives. So yes, it's, yeah. so true actually. Yeah, so it's so unfair that these men need to sort of, I don't know, continue being so uncomfortable with one another when they could all just break down these emotional barriers and walls and just be happy with one another and be comfortable with one another. And that would propel them, you know, to be more successful maybe because mm -hmm. that's when they're more comfortable seeking advice on many matters and then they could encourage each other and sort of help each other to solve these problems that they're facing, these emotional mm -hmm. dilemmas maybe that are hindering them at work or in their relationships. Yeah. There's so many opportunities that comes with emotional discussions. But brown men just don't feel comfortable with it like because that's just not how the way it is you know what culture. i think though i think the a solution i completely agree with everything you said by the way like spot on so well art articulated as usual um <laughs> I, I, <laughs> i'm obsessed with the way you communicate seriously it's the best right. um <laughs> but i've been making so many like mistakes and, and, and like confusions no, like no, because like, like <laughs> really oh, maybe it's my ocd thing thinking, again wow I... he's flawless <laughs> he doesn't have what? Any, he doesn't say like <laughs> or um or uh. <laughs> oh, okay. here i am okay well, oh gosh <laughs> no you've been speaking very well too oh, thank like, you. <laughs> i admire the way you speak I, i've told you that before so yeah, yeah. i appreciate it yeah. um i yeah. think that the solution to this problem I think that if every alpha male, like your typical alpha male, the guy that everyone <laughs> yeah. looks up to, if every alpha the stereotype, male, right? Yeah. yeah, if every alpha male in every social circle just started doing that or just saying, "Yeah, oh, I love you, bro," or like giving a bit of a longer hug or looking into using eye contact more and just yeah. getting in touch with their emotional side more. I reckon it would become the cool new thing and everyone would follow. Right, and right. Like a ripple think, effect. Yes, yeah. I think, yeah, yeah, a ripple or a domino mm. effect. But I've seen this mm. happening with my boyfriend, Jordan. Um, he is, mm. I Oh, would the white say, boy. Yes, the white boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, he is um, very much in touch with his masculinity side. He's very much a um. man. Um, and I would say that, he's very much an alpha male when he comes, he, he dominates spaces and conversations and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and people mm -hmm. tend to gravitate to him. People tend to look up to him um, in social situations. Um, mm -hmm. But he's also very in touch with his emotional side and he's very mm -hmm. feminine too, in that sense that he's very sensitive and very um, emotionally connected. Um, and so I find what I find, it's really interesting to watch him interact with other males, particularly other males that are very not connected to their emotional side, to their feminine um, side. And okay, watch okay. what happens because he's just, my boyfriend Jordan, he's just always being unconditionally himself. Um, mm -hmm. So when he's around other dudes, he'll say things like, oh, bro, how are you? Oh, you know, I really appreciate you. Yeah, you, you're a good friend, um, or mm. I love you, bro. He says I love you a lot, mm. to, especially that's, with friends. Wow, that's so rare and amongst men. Exactly. Yeah. And then yeah. the incredible thing to watch happen happening is mm -hmm. that those men who are generally very reserved or quiet or hyper-masculine or toxic masculine, they start to mm. say, oh, I love you too, bro. And... It's not. Wow, you see? It's yeah. Just, it's it instant. It's instinctive. Yeah. Yeah. And because yeah. he's doing yeah. it in a way that's still masculine, he's not like becoming a a girl or like fangirling. Or yeah, yeah, of course not. He's still himself. He's still the strong man that he is. Yes, but yeah. he's doing it in a way yeah. that's like he can be sensitive and a masculine yeah. man at the same time. Yeah. And yeah. people find that attractive. Other men find that attractive. Of course. And they yeah. go, whoa, I've it's never something seen to that aspire before. towards. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and they go, I've never yeah. seen that before. And they go, oh, mm -hmm. that's that's actually pretty cool. Like that, I didn't know that that was an option <laughs> for me. And they start to mimic that behavior too. And now I've actually noticed that some of even wow. his new friends that never mm -hmm. used to say I love you too, or never used to talk about their feelings or express gratitude or appreciation or 
um, be sensitive or even cry now they mm -hmm. start to do that now like you know wow. at the start of the friendship maybe they never said I love you too when he said I love you but now they say mm -hmm. I love you too wow that's Couple amazing like later. so quickly it just happens like yeah. the ripple effect was so almost instantaneous like it just took place automatically and I, I exactly. think that is testament to what we have been discussing mm. they need to do more of it like the mm. alpha male or the token male in every group when they start yeah. doing it I think it's it has such a pervasive effect and yes. every man would want to be that way because right now you know men they don't know how to be strong and have empathy at the same time like you were saying like they perceive it as a feminacy and brown pressure especially has groomed you know brown men to always be tough and so this uneasy love it still continues between men like they still find it very difficult and they're quite apprehensive about expressing how they feel about each other so mm. i think you're right like the the leader of the pack needs to start doing it and then everyone else will follow suit heck yeah, yeah. um yeah i really want to ask you because i know you're really passionate about this Okay. What about brown male beauty standards? Oh. I find that no one's talked about this <laughs> ever. another can of worms. The first person I've ever come across on the internet to like... Was me? Yeah, brown men. Brown what? Men. I've never seen oh. that ever in my life before. Okay, okay. And I thought, gosh, that needs to be spoken about because yeah, men get insecure too and a lot. Yeah. Every yeah. guy that you see on steroids, in my opinion, my personal opinion, I just think if you feel like you need to take steroids and there must be insecurity there, it's just that yeah. it's not talked about yeah. and think about the amount yeah. of crazy Jack dudes you see. That's all. Yeah. Pretty. So yeah. It's become commonplace. Too. Yeah. Like having a tough muscular, like um, physique, it's become so mm. common these days and the competition in that is also increasing. And I'm like, mm. so is that what makes you a man? having mm -hmm. a tough muscly exterior is that really what defines you mm -hmm. so that itself is a sign of toxic masculinity because people don't understand that the beauty standards being imposed on men is also breeding toxic masculinity yes like this whole gym rat physique it's causing a lot of problems to men's psyches and and how they view themselves their mm -hmm. self-image their self-esteem and People are not discussing it. Even, okay, like in South Asian culture, Bollywood is the most lucrative business, right? And can you believe like the beauty standards that are being imposed on men from Bollywood? I'm like, what? I mean, like Hrithik Roshan, yeah, he's a beautiful man. Yes, like he has beautiful eyes and a beautiful body. Yes, he's what women, you know, would love in a man or whatever. But most brown men do not look like him no. so what are they supposed to do like why are they still perpetuating this i don't know this and this false even, image of what a man should look like yeah what's even more difficult about it for men is that it's not like a common practice like we men don't have makeup like they do <laughs> but you know what i mean like it's now not a common do, practice but, so yeah, it's, it's not, not like common practice, at least yeah. women can sort of they can catfish themselves into looking like a Bollywood actress, but a man's yeah. kind of just stuck with it, yeah. you know, stuck, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> stuck with what yeah. God blessed them with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and and it's so funny because um, I know for a fact that, I mean, from my interactions with like my brown guy friends and what I've also observed is that um, brown men feel like that they are less of, a, that they are less of a man when um, they aren't perceived to be uh like like when their when their appearance is not tough or traditionally masculine when their appearance is not traditionally masculine yes. they feel less of a man because of the beauty standards being imposed by brown culture on them like for example when a man has very um i don't know feminine features he gets picked on a lot at brown culture i don't know if you have noticed like, yes no i totally yeah. have yeah yeah, so even something simple and silly as that could actually take a toll on a man's emotional well-being because throughout his life, he's told that he looks like a girl. He's not good enough. He's not as good as other men just because of the way he looks. Or this could also, you know, take a different direction. When a man is dark-skinned, like I'm dark-skinned, so when a man is dark-skinned, he is thought of as a barbarian or hooligan or someone that is very naturally aggressive and almost like a substitute for the BBC. <laughs> 
the big black cock i've realized yeah. this and i'm like huh so you want me to be like this sexual aggressor like you or you expect me to be a rapist like mm. it's like on one end i'm fetishized and on the other end i'm thought of as a criminal or potential wow. criminal a rapist so i'm like what's wrong with brown people like why are they still not you know like talking about this this is a huge problem i mean i'm sure you agree as well like why is the color of your skin determining how sophisticated or classy you are and again this is rooted in the caste system because um in post colonial times especially darker skinned males were put in roles and jobs that were that had got to do with manual labor while the more fair skinned ones were doing roles that were a bit more uppity mm. <clears throat> so <clears throat> i think this view on men like on brown men like this division in their minds i think it stuck throughout the generations as well and it's still being perpetuated perpetuated today in brown culture which is very unfortunate and sad honestly because yeah. <laughs> i mean yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's so like it, like even colorism. We think about like all these issues, and we just think about females, but we don't realize that um, men go th- through this too. I had an Uber Eats driver the other day, and you know how it has the photo of their like what they look like when they. Oh yes, uh, yes, of course, yeah, 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 and on the app, right? You see yes. what who's and delivering to your home. You get to see who it is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so mm-hmm. he had his profile picture and. It was very clearly an Indian name and he even looked Indian, but he had either bleached his skin or photoshopped his skin to be like paper white, paper white. It was, it was crazy. I thought, oh gosh. And he, he would have, you know, he would have done that because he would have thought, oh, I look so good in this photo now. And it just broke my right, heart. It right, absolutely right. broke my heart to see that because you could just tell. I'm guilty was, of that too. I'm not going to yeah, lie. I've done that really? before. <laughs> Yes, like not now because, okay, because right now I think I've grown to kind of enjoy like my wavy hair and my dark skin, but about four to five years ago, okay, like seven years ago, like starting then, um, like since I would say 2013 when I started university, because that is when I think, um, you know, young people, they're on the lookout for dates and that's when they're actively mm. dating. Like, it's not the puppy relationships we had as teenagers. When we're mm. adults, we're finally, you know, seeking partners that would be worthwhile. So what I noticed is that brown women, they don't really, I don't know, like the number of brown women that would think that a brown man is genuinely handsome and good looking is very low because... Um, most brown women would glorify Bollywood standards. You know, a fair-skinned man with coloured eyes. Yeah, he's the handsome Indian prince. But darker-skinned men are, you know, um, the barbarians or the aggressive ones. So I'm like, okay, but I'm not like that at all. In fact, I would think of myself as the complete opposite of that. So I felt very... um, I started self-hating myself, like, I started hating my skin and yeah, mostly my skin. Like I felt that, oh, this is the only problem that I have in life. If I was lighter skinned, I wouldn't have to face this problem of being judged. Yeah. So I hated my skin so much. It's so weird because a lot of brown men do hate the color of their skin, but we just don't talk about it because either no one takes us seriously or we are told to shut up. Like, oh wow. no, that's so gay. Or that's, yeah, I've always heard this. That is so gay. I'm like, gay is a sexual orientation. What are you even talking about? Like, yeah. how is me whining about my, like me supposedly whining about my um, skin color? How does that make me a homosexual? Like, yeah. this is the culture of brown men today. Like, because brown men have their own, I guess, subculture. They have their own little thing going on. And this is the mentality that they hold on to, to never whine and complain about stuff like that. Like they should yeah. just suck it up and be tough. So this is personally what happened to me. I started hating my, the color of my skin and I would always edit my photos to make myself two shades lighter. And then when I post it on Instagram or Facebook and I get all the likes, I'll be like so happy. And I'll, But at the same time, I'll be so sad because I'll be like, oh no. So if I posted the original color of my skin, no one would have liked my photo. No one would have, you know, commented on it and tell me how good looking I am or whatever. So wow. that's, yeah. So I feel that a lot of brown men go through this as well. I mean, I know that they do because... Um, because of the double standards that 
that exist in brown culture like brown women are sort of more empathized with when it comes to beauty standards but brown men are not and we're expected to keep quiet about it so i don't know like i sort of independently went through my own journey of self discovery and that's how i got lucky and started to love myself more but a lot of brown men are not as lucky as me so i feel really bad for a lot of brown men cuz they're probably still hating themselves i really do think that they are from what i've observed and witnessed yeah first i'm so sorry that you went through that that's horrible oh, that's fine. <laughs> yeah it is horrible yeah Yeah. And yeah like I mean you can't sugarcoat it and I first and secondly I commend you for being vulnerable and open enough to share that like that's that's it's it's quite a um I don't know like a revealing or daunting thing to share like I've shared before that I used to photoshop my photos I was very insecure <laughs> about like my armpits because they were really black oh, <laughs> I chronically like But every see, photo like... post <laughs> before 2019 i promise you was photoshop oh okay <laughs> because i was so insecure that my armpits were black but anyway um but it, it's such a no, but like, do you I see how like after that it was but, like whoa <laughs> but yeah no, there's but, such power in doing that sorry yeah continue no no i was just going to say that you know do you see how you know like black armpits are viewed yes. as wrong and ugly go. but actually they're not like it's yes, just the conditioning so that true. makes us think that way That's like so what true. you mentioned about the noses as well because i have the an ethnic nose as well <laughs> it's really big and yeah so but then you know it's just a conditioning that made us think that we're ugly yes. or we're not good enough yeah so exactly. black armpits they're all like, white That's armpits true. every kind of armpit is beautiful who cares how like, exactly so Damn it's really armpits. the conditioning yeah so <laughs> the conditioning that we have been going through for generations yeah. like our parents as well because i've heard my parents commenting on black armpits as well yes. like it's yeah that's true i think i grew up hearing that a lot and that's probably what did it see? for me and then i ended you up see? getting my armpit yeah. hair lasered and then the discoloration um, went away and so now mm-hmm. they're like the same skin color but um it's amazing what <laughs> damage aunties gossiping can do exactly <laughs> and our parents like- gossiping Yeah. yeah and people don't understand that brown men go through the same trauma of it as well it's so very discounted and it's yes. not taken into consideration or or maybe it's just dismissed because mm. brown men are expected to be war heroes right so mm. we're not allowed to talk about our feelings remember so yes. i think that is why mm. we just don't you know speak about anything wow. like when it comes to beauty standards but they are very much affecting men as well in brown culture wow Yeah, and yeah. I, I mean you know, you know it's funny also you don't hear the the word double standards with <laughs> yeah. like double standards towards women but you mm. don't hear it for men because for men, there are yeah. there are there are also double standards the other way around. Oh. And it's oh, time that yes. we start talking about it because it's important. Yeah. Yeah, um, we we should publicly sort of I don't know express our views about it as well because people think that um men are tough by nature and we can take it like a man and we will we are not um that you know that we are not sensitive towards um harsh criticism like it doesn't affect us much but it really does and that is why we should speak about it more openly and publicly because mm. brown men are really hurting on the inside because yeah. of these double standards they really are and people are not really understanding this i don't know why they're just refusing to accept that brown men are being hurt as well mm. people just don't want to accept it i don't and know why it but... doesn't serve their feminist agenda <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> exactly it probably also doesn't sell like it probably doesn't make money um yeah i don't yeah, know yeah it's not popular yeah yeah it's not it's not yeah. marketable it's not, not lucrative yeah yeah exactly like, yeah and um <laughs> What what are some other brown brown um like double standards towards brown men particularly? Okay, I think um this might be a controversial one, but it's Go something ahead. to do with it's men and okay, like the dating pool, the dating scene. Yes. Because just like women, um men endure through 
you know, varying levels and forms of abuse as well. I think yeah. we need to come to terms with that. And, and these days, most people, both in Western and Eastern countries, um, people become, you know, people are becoming more comfortable with calling out bullshit and, you know, um, calling out abusive behavior. But this is only done when women are victims. It's not done when men are victims. Yes. Like, but yes, I'm like, you're but right. you see, that's the thing. You see, I'm glad that you agree because most women, they wouldn't agree. But but the truth is women are more emotionally aggressive than men. Like yeah, from what I have true. observed. No, that's true. Like, it's true. And yeah. biologically speaking, this is not to offend anyone. It's just a <laughs> biological fact. If you took us as cavemen back in those days and you observed our behavior, <laughs> it would still be true. So continue, see, yes. Yeah, so you see, um, yeah, people don't, agree. they don't want to accept that women are the emotional aggressors of the world and men, they might be the mm-hmm. physical aggressors, but women can be very emotionally manipulative towards yes. men, especially like in our feminist world today, in more, um, in more developed countries where women are living more privileged lives. Mm-hmm. They can treat men really badly. And it's funny because... Um, uh, in brown culture, women empowerment today is one of the forerunning social movements. So because of that, I think men are really afraid to call out bullshit on women. They're very afraid to talk about the abuse they go through because I have, okay, this might, okay, I'm scared to share this, but okay, there's this incident that I've, um, I've, that I knew happened to my guy friend, my brown friend. He was sort of like, used as a sex object by this girl he was seeing and he even said it to me um that she was sort of using him like like a blank canvas and she just gets to paint all over him so that analogy sort of made a lot of sense to me and i was like oh okay so yeah so i was shocked because i was like but it doesn't seem like that because you're all tough and muscular and she's all dainty and feminine but people don't know what goes behind the scenes and it's very prevalent in brown culture because i've noticed this when men are not doing what these girls want these women are immediately ready to be like emasculate the men and make very derogatory remarks and comments towards the men like oh what kind of man are you like you know oh you're such a wimp you're such a weakling you know you're not man enough but that's a form of abuse but when men do that people attack them immediately or oh, how dare you disrespect women but when women do that no one is saying or oh, how dare you disrespect men so that's there's so no one really true. defending men yeah so, so it's true. very sad exactly so it's just really disheartening to witness so many brown men going through this emotional abuse from brown women yeah. wow no i totally yeah. i totally agree i also think that like yeah. um I have heard some horror story incidents where like people have been falsely accused of rape and things like that. And it's just like (laughs) purely because they're a dude and like, you know, and especially at the level when you get high, like celebrities and things like that, um, you see a lot of like exes coming out and like taking advantage of the movement, like hashtag me too. And, and then, filing a lawsuit and trying to like just basically get money out of their exes who have now become mm-hmm. famous um yeah and it's just yeah it's just horrible like i definitely yeah. think there are some crazy yeah. people out there yeah, and, um, and it's so unfair yeah. because i feel that that brown women like, i really feel that they're taking advantage of this tough false image of men that is yeah. still prevalent like they mm. use that in their arguments like oh you know how indian men are you know how south asian men are they're all just aggressive bullies they're so insensitive but to me it's like no you're the one who's perpetuating this image because that's not how they really are it's just yes. how they expect it to be and mm. you keep you know reinforcing this idea and mm. it's very sad because i feel that um brown men they are mostly introduced to more brash and forceful approaches in communication styles so they don't know how to effectively and diplomatically sort of um communicate with women if that makes sense yes yeah 100 percent agreed when they're un yeah so when they're unhappy they either react overtly aggressive or either they just shut down and just take it take all the abuse yeah so they don't know how to really speak up 
you know, in a more effective manner. And I think, remember the other day you were mentioning about setting up a school for brown men, teaching them yeah. how to communicate with women. Yeah. I think it should also, this school that you want to maybe, you know, start one day, I think it should also include lessons on how to stand up against women effectively instead of yes. being aggressive and at the same time not being a you know being a doormat as well like they need 100%. to find the middle ground yeah 100% and I think also yeah like I think men are naturally less expressive right but like yeah. you said yeah. women are definitely more expressive and so like it's hard for men to communicate verbally and so a lot of the times like men will be more physically um, like will express something more physically that's why you see like yeah. men are more into sports or things like that. It's yes. just by nature, yeah. like they're more physical expression and then physically mm-hmm. reacting would be getting aggressive or physically just shutting down and being yeah. a complete, like just bottling your emotions. So hundred percent agree mm-hmm. with what you said. And um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Along but the it's lines- just that, you know, we're not getting, um, enough guidance and and advice on how to go about doing that today so brown men are very much stuck in this situation yeah so they're either being accused of being this aggressive bully or this chauvinist who abuses women or they're accused of being a weakling who doesn't know how to please a woman so i'm like (laughs) that's it's just so unfair and you know like they get a really bad rap because they're um because of like you know the creepy brown men stereotype um Mm -hmm. which I definitely have like used before and I feel very like badly of that because I I told you about this. I had an encounter. I I, I used to have horrible encounters with creepy brown men um, growing up. Like (laughs) as soon as I hit puberty, I was way too young and I I was just constantly either getting hit on in real life or like feeling really uncomfortable being eye raped or um, getting DMs online. And my Facebook was just full of messages all the time because I think mm-hmm. especially for the more um for the brown men that have grown up more traditionally um they are grown up very separate from women so they, they yeah, probably yeah. go to like all boys school or girls school or I whatever. did I went to yeah. an all boys school for 10 years I was in an all boys school so. yeah oh we'll get into yeah. that that's interesting <laughs> Um, yeah, so they, and, and even like socially, um, the way they've been socially introduced into the world, it's always like, I don't know, men and women are very separate in brown culture. Yeah. Um, and then for some reason, like, you know, because of that, they think, oh, women are from Venus and men are from Mars and you just can't, (laughs) like, they're, they're not humans. Like you have to speak to them in a different way. And a lot of that Uh, behavior is modeled from their dads you know, yeah, and agreed, from that older generation. Yeah. And so to a certain extent, you can't really blame them because it's not theirs. Mm. It's not Thank who you. they are. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's a facade yeah. that they're putting on. This They're taught this, to be that way. Yes, this pressure to yeah. be this masculine guy um, mm-hmm. and like all, all the pressure from their male friends to get with a girl um, or hook up yeah. with a girl. And so there's there's so much pressure that causes a creepy brown man to be a creepy brown man. Anyway, so I I used to make fun of creepy brown men. I I used to abuse them a bit online. I'm not proud of it. I very much regret it. I don't think it was nice. I mean, you were young. It's fine. I mean, it was your instant reaction. Exactly. I was was very much offended that um, I suppose these more traditional brown men would see me or see my profile picture on Facebook and see like a – a westernized South Asian girl who is very like empowered in her body, like, and who was young mm. and like confident versus mm-hmm. like maybe the women that they see who are very submissive, conservative and, and, yeah. and conservative and not allowed to yeah. be themselves. And I suppose, mm-hmm. I think that's why they, these more traditional stereotypically creepy Brown men go after more westernized south asian girls like me on the internet because they they seem like sexual confidence and just empower confidence like a prize to win yes exactly yeah Yeah. and so because it makes them look good in front of their brown guy friends as well if they score you you know what yeah exactly so toxic masculinity again yeah yeah and yeah again like maybe i'm being fetishized i'm not sure but um they go after us and and then me and my friends would kind of like 
make a joke out of it, bully them, regretted it. Then one day I thought, oh, I think what I'm doing is really nasty. I think I need to stop this. And I don't know what propelled me to do this, but the next guy that happened to, um, like if I didn't reply on some place, a lot of guys, like they were very persistent. They would find me on a different account or a different social media. And so this guy had found me on Tinder. I swiped left. He swiped right. Um, He wasn't happy with that. So he went on Instagram or Facebook or something, found me again, messaged me. I instantly recognized. I was like, wait, isn't this the guy that was on Tinder? And, And anyway, he was very creepy. I don't know how he slid in, but it was just, just wasn't a good pickup line. And, um, then, (laughs) then I, I just, something possessed me to ask why, like, why is it you feel the need to talk to me like that? Or why, yeah. Why are you being this way? Why are you being creepy? <laughs> I think it stems from, from you having had enough of this as well, right? You yes, just wanted to get to the root I, of the problem as well. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Like why? Mm-hmm. And um, anyway, so we kind of had this chat and luckily this guy was open enough to chat about it. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, was he yeah. from Australia as well? Was he a yeah, brown he man living in Australia? Studying in Australia. So he just migrated uh, from India to Australia okay, okay. to do his master's. And um, mm-hmm. so he, he's a smart dude then. He's yes. doing his master's. He should have some level of intelligence. Yeah. And yet he behaved that way. Yeah. Yes. And um, I, yeah. I asked him why. And he said, he surprisingly, like, you know, we kind of like were talking back and forth. And it kind of turned into a bit of a counseling session. Um, and I was really trying to get like deeper and deeper. And um, surprisingly throughout the process, what I learned, the major takeaway was that I didn't have to go on a feminist rant with him. He understood what he was doing was wrong, um, that mm. the way he was treating women or seeing women wasn't right because he had a mother and a sister. And he understood that in a blink of a second. It was the crux of the matter was actually that he was just super insecure within himself. He had no confidence. He didn't know how to speak to women um, or Mm -hmm. like he didn't know how to speak to women. He didn't realize that women were just humans that he could just be himself. And he had all this pressure from his family and everything. And I just, and, and ever since then, so me and him became really good friends. Um, I, by the way, I've, to, I've asked oh, wow. his permission to tell this story. So, um, <laughs> but I, I can't, I'm not saying his name because of his personal reasons, but um, he. I mean, I'm anonymous too. So yes, I exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. him and I good, uh, we became good friends. Um, and I actually like helped him get his first proper date. A respectable yeah, girl. You, you mentioned this he, before yeah. yeah and he had a yeah. proper like his first proper relationship and it was wow. very successful and um we like hung out in real life and all of this stuff and I mean we follow each other on social media like we can top, keep in touch every now and then and think he's still wow. studying and yeah like it's been it's been great and it just completely um crushed this stereotype that I had about creepy Indian men because I do think there are creeps out there. I do think that oh, there yeah. is a reason the rape rate is so high in our countries, in our South Asian yeah. countries. But I think that mm-hmm. it's from a smaller minority than we think. I think that maybe 60 to 70% of the brown men that we think are creepy brown men are actually just insecure brown men that are yes. actually too insecure yeah. to actually go out there and rape anyone. Mm-hmm. I think they're exactly. all talk and no action. Yeah, a, a exactly. large percentage of it. Of course, I'm yeah. not dimish, diminishing the fact that the rape rate is so high and that mm-hmm. that needs to be fixed. But most of them, definitely people that they're do not that, but like what, yes, yeah. And I yeah. think they get a really bad rap because there are some idiots, mm-hmm. a small amount of idiots <laughs> that really like screw it up for yeah. brown men. For but most of them, yeah. Yeah, I think it's just modeled yeah. behavior. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I agree because th- there's there are no proper like teachings or widely accepted ideologies that. Um, teach and educate brown men to communicate in a non-violent way mm. so they don't really know how to flirt and be cheeky in a yeah. um, non-offensive way they mm. don't know how to approach a woman um, you know like well they don't know how to do it properly so they end up doing it very clumsily and it comes off as aggressive or chauvinistic but actually no they're just doing what they've been taught to do mm-hmm. most of the time like they think that that's what women want they think that they need to be this hunter and the, and women are these like you know innocent 
bunnies jumping about and hopping around. So, because that's what they've been taught since a very young age, that, oh, they are, you know, like this superhero and women are the damsels and, you know, that's how they should approach women. But like what you said, when they are taught the right approaches and right techniques when it comes to dating, I think they would do really well. Like you see, like you helped one guy out and he had a very successful relationship with a nice young girl as well. So yeah. I think that's proof that brown men are not hopeless. Like, you know, no, they're not. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. That, that experience was like such a gift to me because it made me realize that they're actually not all that creepy as we think they are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, they're and, really not. Most of them are not. Yeah. yeah. And it's all from this horrible pressure of you have to be a man that's being pushed yeah. upon them. Yeah, exactly. In yeah. fact, I think most of the time, a lot of brown men, they do want to approach women in a very soft, sensitive manner, but they're scared that maybe these women would be like, oh, why are you so girly? Or why are you so weird and weak? Why are you different? So they're scared of being judged that way as well. So they need to upkeep that that image, yes. which is which is really sad. Yeah. This moves on to my next question. Do you think mm-hmm. that women have unfair expectations on brown oh. men? And if so, what are they? Tell me. I'm, I'm scared to say anything, but I'm anonymous, so I'm safe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I believe that the pervading and like the most pertinent like issue is that brown women, they really get confused between reality and brown culture fantasies like that are being perpetuated either within the community or via film industries and songs and like when it comes to relationships many brown women their minds it vacillates between like um, reality and very distorted contradicting fantasies because especially today on one end you know they want a sensitive young gentleman who understands their feelings blah 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 but on the other hand they want this superhero, warrior, whatever person that reminds them of their dads, of their grandfathers, you know, of you know, the stereotypes that um brown culture perpetuates even today. Like it's so funny because they don't understand that what they are promoting and expecting from men can actually become very harmful and dangerous as well. Because what they are doing is actually telling brown men to upkeep toxic masculinity. Like they're not ex- they're not understanding that by imposing these double standards, I mean, these, sorry, these unfair standards on men, they are actually breeding toxic masculinity. So um, by doing that, they forget that certain types of behavior should not be put up with, like abuse and and could be emotional abuse or verbal abuse. But a lot of brown women I've observed, they are fine with putting up with such behavior in the hopes of, you know, experiencing the more... um, beneficial sides of traditional masculinity so what they do is not only are they um you know victimizing themselves by perpetuating toxic masculinity but then when they bear the brunt of it you know when they become victims of it they are saying that oh you know like we are the victims we didn't ask for it but then i'm like hello you're the one who tell these men to behave this way you're the ones who are telling brown men to maintain this tough aggressive persona because these men, they might not be naturally that way. And then when they had enough of, you know, the pressure, they might just burst and they might not act in ways that these women want. And then that becomes a problem as well. So basically, this brown culture fantasy situations in their heads, they need to put an end to it because they can't expect brown men to always be this Bollywood hero all the time. You know, not all men are Prince Charmings or knights in shining armor. You know, brown men, they just, I mean, from what I know, brown men are just regular men. They're just like men, you know, from other parts of the world. All they want to do is okay. just be happy and have a good time with their significant others, with their better halves. They just want a happy, healthy relationship. They actually don't want to be this aggressive person. But brown women, for some reason, they still do want their men to yes. be that way and at the same time they impose a lot of these beauty standards on men as well like it's actually women who are imposing very unfair beauty standards of men if you have mm-hmm. realized it's actually not men because they are the ones who 
you know, uh, pursuing these men, right? So they are telling men what they should do, what they should look mm-hmm. like. And these men are like, oh, okay, so I have to do this. I have to do that. Okay, I'll do it. And when they start doing it and they start failing at it, obviously, you know, it takes a toll on them as well. Mm-hmm. So this is very unfair. I mean, women are just, I don't know, they're just not being sensitive towards men today. Yeah. Like, they're really not being sensitive towards men. Yeah. Sorry for like no, ranting. No, no, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I totally agree with everything you said. Um, it's so hard. I, In my opinion, I think it's really a tough thing for women to see that men have issues equally as well. Um because I find that, like, as you said, it's that thing of like, well, I have bigger issues than you. Um, do you think yeah. it's possible? Do you think and how would it be possible to rectify this whole situation in an ideal world? To have women listen to men more and men to find maybe an outlet for expression mm-hmm. more and to yeah. basically solve these problems we've been talking about today. What would be like your ideal solution? Well, um, from what I've observed with brown people our age, like our generation of brown folks, mm-hmm. um, what they really take to, what they typically enjoy is pop culture, right? It's mm, movies yeah. and films. I feel that maybe the best, the ideal solution is to address and portray these issues through these mediums. Like, for example, instead of just putting up an Instagram post about how unfair it is, that brown men are suffering and and not allowed to speak up on their problems. Maybe there should be a movie about it, a short film about it, or maybe a music video about it. Like, I feel that that's the best way to reach out to the masses. I mean, people our age, because that's what they're paying attention to. And so when they see it in front of them, they're experiencing it for themselves. And then they understand it, you know, fundamentally like, oh, so this is why... um, brown this is what brown men are going through as well maybe we should talk about it more but i would say that the more feasible option is to well teach this in schools yeah i feel that that's the best thing to do to attack the problem at its root to nip it in the bud like Mm. to start at a very young age to tell girls to be sensitive towards boys because boys are always taught to give in to girls right at a very young Mm. age but yes girls are not taught to do that so you see the double standard that's actually so true even with um like asking the dude always has to ask the girl out on the date because he he, needs to be the gentleman exactly and then and and they're always at the mercy of the woman because then the woman says no sorry and then they get rejected and then they're whole identity is completely crippled and crushed yeah it's crashing down yeah wow so i think that's the best solution but for people our age i think that the media i mean pop culture would be the best way to go like someone needs to sort of make us like i don't know write a song about it and present it to the world or you know yeah or maybe i don't know a tv series about it about what men go through about what brown men face yeah maybe a web series or something yeah I think that would be the best way. Yeah. Yeah. Because if, yeah, I mean, because don't you agree that um, brown people our age, like the way we celebrate our culture is through pop culture, like the fusion of East meets meets West and, you know, like, so I think that's the best way to go to address these issues. In fact, it might be the only way to go because I don't think brown people would care about this issue unless it's present in Mm. the space that they are in. So pop yeah. culture would be the most effective and effectual, you know, uh, means of doing this. Yeah, I love that. That's such a great solution, especially because movies and videography specifically um, yeah. as an art form. Yes. Like, I think that, that that is the best art form to clearly increase people's perception on, on issues. Yeah. Um, yeah, that yes. was so powerful. Um, I mean, we see a lot of feminists, like, I mean, feminist values being portrayed in, in like, in videos that yes. are being posted on Instagram by a lot of social media influencers. Yeah. Like, I mean, there's so many female, I mean, I feel that there's, like, the female brown social media influencers are higher in number than the male social media brown influencers. 100%, 100%. So, um, issues are not being talked about because, yes. yeah. That's true. So it's very yeah. Unfair. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally agree. Um, 
also another thing I thought to, I just thought about as you were saying I think a couple points down but um I think oh, that wow. how you said that like the pressure from women to men to be a good partner and a and, and a man in the relationship um I I think tell me if you mm-hmm. what you think about this I think that this should be in good. media in media I know <laughs> In media, women are like hypersexualized, and then men are hyper romanticized. Yes. And and because yes. it, it really like plays to what oh my God. men and women want, right? Like I think men yeah. have this deep desire, like sexual desire, and that's not a bad thing. That's actually just like how men are physically hardwired, because like yes. to procreate. It's nature. Um, yeah, yeah, and women are yeah. naturally more sexually conservative because they want to protect their mm-hmm. eggs and they want to make sure that they choose the right partner, which will then yeah. result in um, a better quality offspring and yes. human survival, yeah. etc. Um, so that's actually just how it biologically is. So I'm sick of people saying, oh, like, what, this is... No, it's just like <laughs> men like sex. I mean, women like sex, yeah. too, but, like, men yeah. are more sexually, like driven in an assertive way yeah, because to the point yeah yes that that's how yeah. we keep human existence running and it wouldn't we wouldn't be alive if that didn't work <laughs> right, right? Or like we wouldn't have yeah. the internet we wouldn't have this beautiful modern day society of men yeah like women. exactly yeah um but then i think that women's needs um it's like men's needs are more sexual women's needs it's are more complex more <laughs> complex and emotional and mm-hmm. that's met through an intimate relationship, right? And so then, yes. of course, they monetize that. They commercialize that. Sex yeah. sells. Yeah. Ro- romanticizing, yeah. Box, like, relationship sells. Mm-hmm. Relationships, um, yes. Yeah. And they make that, like, I find that there are so many chick flicks and romantic comedies and movies, <laughs> yeah. even Bollywood movies that are just, yeah. so, like, that portray relationships unrealistic. in such an unrealistic way. Yeah. Yes. And I'm like, yeah. Like, I'm sorry, but you're just <laughs> ne- not going to find a perfect man that's like that because we're human, Yeah, you know? Yeah. We're human yeah. and, like, <laughs> yeah. you can't – and women have this ridiculous idea that men have to be perfect in relationships. And yeah. then, they, and then they, yes. after they break up, they go through this whole phase where they're like, oh, I hate men. Huh? Why are all Oh, men oh my shit? God. I'm like, Don't even get me started on that. That's had, the phase that I – You just had – the like, well, expectations yeah. were through the roof. Like that's yeah. why you set yourself up yeah. for failure in a relationship. Yeah, yeah. And it's I mean, because I think of that's... this media yeah. betrayal of relationships. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that that kind of relates to what I was mentioning earlier about women always wanting, like brown women, especially expecting their brown men to always be this tough sort of person, this person, this tough sort of person. At the same mm-hmm. time, they want they are meant to also be the most romantic person. So it's two different, it's like two ends of the spectrum. They want it in one man, like they want the yes. most romantic man around and they and they want the most traditionally masculine, tough man around. Yes. So this is only existing in Bollywood, this type of man, it only exists in yes. fiction, not in yeah. real life. That That's also what I meant about, you know, reality versus fantasy, the brown fantasy. culture, Bollywood fantasy. Yeah, so I think you're you're right about how the reason why they get pissed off is because the expectations are not met and the expectations are just not realistic at all. Exactly. Exactly. No, that's amazing. Um, Yeah. I think we have to wrap up this, um, this conversation. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, Yes. I mean, it's been quite, it's been a very long one. It's been a very long one and I'm impressed if anyone made it to the end. Um, But it was definitely, (laughs) I I mean, I learned so much from you and I love it when I do podcasts and I feel like I've learned something from the other person because that's, that's what this is about. And I feel like, I hope that you all listening have learnt and opened your mind and perspective to something different, something new today. Thank you for tuning in to the Brown Paint Podcast. Please make sure to follow us on Instagram at Brown Paint Brown and listen to the next couple episodes coming out on Spotify and Apple Podcasts.